Jeannie Forrester was born in Michigan and later moved to Houston before settling in New Hampshire, where she received a political science degree from UNH and later an MBA. Forrester has held positions in the small business and nonprofit worlds. She was the town administrator in New Durham and Tufton Borough and is currently a New Hampshire state senator. She lives in Meredith with her husband. Senator Forrester, it's time for your opening statement. Good evening. There are four candidates before you tonight. Only one has been endorsed by the union leader, and I'm proud to say that I am that candidate. The union leader has endorsed me because I'm the most conservative, I have the experience, and I am the best chance for Republicans to take the corner office in November. Senator Thank you. Forrester, thanks. Up next, Executive Counselor Chris Sununu. Chris Nunu was born in Boston, grew up in Salem, New Hampshire, and received a bachelor's degree in civil environmental engineering at MIT. He worked for 10 years cleaning up hazardous waste sites and was the owner and director of Sununu Enterprises. He has been a member of the Executive Council since 2010 and is the CEO of Waterville Valley Resort. He is married, has three children, and lives in Newfield. Councilor Sununu, your opening statement, please. Thank you, and thank you to MUR and the union leader for hosting us tonight. New Hampshire is a great state. A great state, but we have to do better for our people, our communities, our businesses that power our economy. We have a great opportunity this election cycle to put proven conservative leadership back into the governor's office, and I'll be that candidate. Councilor Sununu, thanks. Let's move on now to Manchester Mayor Ted Gatsis. Ted Gatsis was born and raised in Manchester and graduated from UNH. He and his brother founded Staffing Network, an employee leasing company, before he was elected to the Board of Aldermen. Gatsis later went on to become a state senator, eventually the Senate president, before becoming mayor of Manchester. He is now currently in his fourth term. He is married and lives in Manchester. Mayor Gatsis, your opening statement, please. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and thank you to MUR and the union leader for sponsoring this debate. You will hear this evening about perceptions versus reality. Those are the things that we'll be talking about and who's going to lead this state forward. So I look forward to the questions that you're going to ask. And last but not least, State Representative Frank Edelblue. Frank Edelblue was born in Pennsylvania and graduated from the University of Rhode Island. He also has a master's degree from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. He started his career as a CPA at Price Waterhouse Coopers, started his own company, Control Solutions, and then joined an angel investment group. He is a New Hampshire state rep. He's married and has seven children and lives in Wilton. Representative Edelblue, take it away. So I am the only candidate on this stage who is not a career politician. I am a proven job creator. I have fought for fiscally conservative issues my whole life, and I also have fought for conservative values, and I look forward to having a conversation with you tonight. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, candidates, for being here. Let's also introduce tonight's panelists. Dave Solomon is a reporter for the New Hampshire Union Leader, Adam Sexton from WMUR, and he's a political reporter, and Ali Morris, a reporter for the Concord Monitor. All right, so let's get right to it. And we're going to begin with something you just touched on, uh, Representative Edelblue. As you all know, Republican voters here in New Hampshire uh, made it very known that uh, in the first in the nation primary that political resumes don't matter. In fact, it could be argued that uh, ties to the establishment uh, could be viewed as a liability rather than a benefit. All of you currently hold elected office. Some of you have for years. So how do you make the case to the tens of thousands of voters in New Hampshire that you're not an establishment politician simply trying to sound like an outsider. We're going to start with Executive Counselor Chris Sununu. You have one minute. Thank you, Josh. Um, look, my, my father was involved in politics. My brother was involved in politics. But it's public service. That's what separates New Hampshire uh, from the rest of the country. It's public service. It's how we tithe our time. It, when I grew up in, in, in Salem, my mother taught us very clearly, you have to give back to your communities. You have to give back somehow. Be a teacher. Donate at a local nonprofit. Participate in public service. And that's what we do here. Um, that's how we, we commit ourselves. And given my experience, my background in business, uh, my experience in, in classrooms with my kids, my passion with it to, to education, my experience in uh, dealing with the opioid crisis, again, whether it's with, with, whether it's with my business, or what I see affecting our schools and our kids and in the future of our kids moving forward, that's the kind of experience and leadership I'm trying to bring to the table. And that's what the people in New Hampshire want. That's what they're craving out there. Um, so again, it's, it's about public service. It's not about making a career out of it. I've been proud to serve in the Executive Council for five years, and we're going to bring that experience to the table and make a change for New Hampshire. Senator Gat or Mayor Gatz, you've been in politics a long time. Thanks, Josh. I can tell you that uh, when I see people at different events, and I go to an awful lot of events, 
they're just amazed at uh, how many times they see me at different things, whether it's a Little League game, whether it's at a school event, whether it's at a choir practice. They just think that it's all about the events that I'm going to. And I can tell you that it's, I'm proud to be going to those events because it makes a big difference in those folks' lives. I can tell you that when I sit down and sign 4,000 graduate uh, uh, honor roll letters every quarter to all the students in the city of Manchester, I can tell you I have more grandparents and parents come up to me and talk to me about those letters that I've sent for the last seven years in every single quarter. Senator Forrester. You know, uh, six years ago when I decided to run for the Senate, it was to be a voice for my communities. And I'm proud to say that's exactly what I've been in my time served. Uh, one of the first votes I cast, 23 to 1, and I was that one vote against Democrats and Republicans on a piece of legislation that I had heard would hurt my communities. I also fought the establishment when it came to protecting private property rights. I went toe to toe with the establishment. I fought the energy lobbyists on the issue of private property. So I have a history and a record of standing up and standing for the people of New Hampshire. And I think that's what we need in the corner office. And Thank Representative Anabalu, same question to you. So this is an easy question, Josh, because I am not a career politician. I have been in office for one and a half years, long enough to know what the problems are, but not so long as to become one of them. I have not planned my career saying I'm going to go from one position to another position and eventually I will achieve the position of governor. I will tell you that running for governor was not on my bucket list of things to do. But somebody needs to stand up for the people of New Hampshire. And so I have thrown my hat in the ring and I hope to be able to represent the people of New Hampshire in the corner office so that they have a voice. All right, thank you, sir. Let's go to our panel now. A question coming from Allie Morris of the Concord Monitor about the top of the ticket. Allie, take it away. Good to see you guys. So all of you have signaled support for your party's nominee for president. If you were asked by a child why you are voting for Donald Trump, what would you say? And Representative Edelblue will start with you. So I'm happy to start with that question, and I will gladly support our nominee, and I will gladly vote against Hillary Clinton, who I think will bring more destructive policies to our country. But what we have to understand is how our constitutional republic is designed to function. We are supposed to be made up of strong states, and strong states are what makes for a strong country. And so I am focused on running for governor to make sure that New Hampshire is one of the strong states that helps to make New Hampshire great again. Senator Forrester, same question. I will support proudly our Republican nominee. And I would say to a child, look, uh, we have seen the destruction of years and years of Democratic control in, in the White House. We have to end this. We have to put a Republican in the corner office in Washington, D.C., who's going to represent the values of America, who's going to stand up and fight for people. And I don't believe that Hillary Clinton will be that person. So I will support our nominee. Mayor Gatsis. Well, I think the first thing that I would say to a child is that uh, decisions on who they choose to be president are personal. And I think it's important that they have the ability to make those decisions because I can tell you that Donald Trump may not be the perfect candidate, but he's somebody that I support and is better than the alternative. And sometimes you don't get that perfect candidate and it's the best thing for this country. So I can tell you that Donald Trump is somebody that I look at, I support, and I endorse. And Councilor Sununu. Thank you. Uh, yes, I've always said I would support the nominee. It's, it's Donald Trump, and I support him. I endorse him. Uh, we've said it from the beginning. Um, public service is about public trust. That's really what this is. It's okay to disagree on issues. It's okay to have viable debate. And it's frankly, it's okay when, when candidates frankly say things you may not dis, dis, you may disagree with and not agree with. That's part of the process. But this comes down to public trust. I believe that the Democrats, especially Hillary Clinton, has violated that public trust time and time again. So while there are always, you're never going to find that perfect candidate out there, it's important to understand that pu public process um, and the public uh, service that we look for in the candidates that we support. It's about trust, leadership, and honesty. All right, thank you, candidates. Sticking with the panel now, question coming from Dave Solomon of the Union Leader on Immigration. Dave. All right, thank you, Josh. Uh, as you're all aware, New Hampshire has an aging demographic, a low birth rate, declining migration from Massachusetts. So economists have told us that international immigration is critical to developing the workforce we need to grow the economy in this state. Do you agree with that? Uh, and if so, what would you do to encourage that immigration? 
And if you don't agree, please explain, uh, starting with Mayor Gatsis. Well, thank you for the question. I can tell you that certainly I'm somebody that's been out there supporting immigrants. I think it's important that we have them in this state. I think it's important that we have them in this country. But I can tell you the one thing that the immigrants will tell you is that they want to make sure that they get a good job so that they can support their family and they can learn the language. Those are the two most important things. And when I was looking for a moratorium four years ago, those are the things that I went up and talked to the governor and the executive council about to allow the folks that are here now the opportunity to find those good jobs and to learn the language. But again, I didn't get the support of the council because they voted to make sure that they send them. When you see the immigration in this city, you know that when we speak 62 different languages at Central High School, it's something that we should be talking about, even though that these immigrants are working hard to find their, the way, their way through life. I think it's important that we do the best we can. But again, the Syrian immigration is something we have to consider because we don't know who some of those immigrants are. All right, Senator Forrester, same question to you. My number one priority as governor of the state of New Hampshire will be the safety and security of our residents. Having said that, I do support immigration, but I believe we need to make sure those immigrants are properly vetted before they come into the state. You know, a week or so ago, I uh, toured the border, the Canadian border, with the Border Patrol agent, and they showed me the 58 miles of border of uh, Canada and New Hampshire, three checkpoints and informed me of their concerns because 25,000 refugees had been uh, brought into Canada and we have a very porous border uh, in Canada and from what I've heard the vetting process of those Syrian refugees is highly in question. So as governor I say yes to immigration but I say also we need to make sure we have a proper vetting process. Thank you. Councilor Sununu. Thank you. Uh, when the Obama administration first proposed bringing in 10,000 immigrants into this country, I stood up and I said no. The federal government cannot and has not shown their ability to do their job, to protect our citizens, to, to use the vetting process as well as it can be used to ensure who's coming in, what their motives are. And so I stood up and I said no to that. The idea that immigration is a workforce driver for the state of New Hampshire, um, I completely disagree with. The best workforce drivers for the state of New Hampshire is a governor that understands business in the year 2016, a governor that lives and breathes business issues that can go out across our borders into our region, bring businesses in, make the investments to incentivize young workers to stay here, incentivize workers to come here. That's one of the primary jobs of a governor, and it's an exactly what I'm going to do. Chris, that's, you know, that comes down to perception and reality. The perception is, is that you stand up and say that you stood up and you were against immigration. However, the reality is, is that when I went up to the governor's council and you were there, and I asked for a moratorium on refugees, you voted against it. That's perception and reality. The, the moratorium on refugees back in 2011 had nothing to do with the 10,000 Syrian refugees that President Obama was, was purporting to bring in. Those are two completely separate issues. All right, we've got to get uh, Representative Edel Blue's take on this. Thank you. So, so absolutely, as governor, my job is to make sure that our communities are safe for our citizens. But there's a premise in the question that says if we don't bring younger people into our communities, that we can't have a thriving economy. And I think that that's a wrong premise because that premise doesn't take into, fact, into account the fact that not only is New Hampshire aging, but the United States is aging and the world is aging. Let's make sure that that demographic reality is built into our economic development plans. Simply because we're aging doesn't mean we can't have a thriving economy. What we really want to do is we want to take that demographic uh, development of an aging population and make it work for our economy. New Hampshire could take the lead in that. Areas like medical devices and therapies in terms of medicine, those can become economic engines for New Hampshire. The aging population is not a liability, it is an asset that we need to treat as such. All right, thank you, candidates. Let's move on to a discussion that a lot of voters see as the number one issue facing the state of New Hampshire. We're talking about the crisis of addiction. To give people an idea of the problem, most recent state stats show that from 2013 to 2015, there was a 128% increase in the number of drug-related deaths in New Hampshire. And the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner projects that there will be 482 drug-related deaths, almost 500 this year. And we have some specific questions tonight about this problem. So starting things off that line of questioning, Adam Sexton. 
Senator Forrester, you've said you'd consider deploying the New Hampshire National Guard along our border with Canada and also along the state line with Massachusetts as a component to fight the drug war. What exactly would those troops be doing and what purpose would it serve? Sure. So as governor, my number one priority is the safety and security of the people of the state of New Hampshire. Look, we have a serious heroin and opioid epidemic in this state. And as governor, I am going to make sure that we use all the tools in the toolbox to address this issue. It's really interesting because I have been um, uh, criticized by my opponents on this issue. And I find that curious because right now we are using the National Guard in New Hampshire to address the crisis here. And we are using that actually in, in um, Manchester. As governor, it is my duty and responsibility to work on and execute the counter drug program here in New Hampshire. So I would bring together the National Guard, law enforcement, and the community leaders to talk about what we need to do to make sure we address this crisis in New Hampshire. We need to be serious. Representative Edelblue, some say part of the problem here is the alleged overprescription of opioids and there not being adequate oversight between doctors and patients. In your view, are pharmaceutical companies engaging in the deceptive advertising of opioids and the New Hampshire Attorney General is investigating this. As governor, would you 100% back up that investigation? Well, I would certainly support the investigation, but I think, Adam, what we really need to do is look at the problem. The opiates themselves are not the problem. They are an inanimate object, right? I mean, the problem is the responsible use of those opiates. We know that there are many patients who have suffered from chronic pain for years, and they have been treated well with opiates. And so if we can make sure that individuals are, are informed and that doctors are informed and so that there's a responsible use of the drugs, then I don't think we have a problem. So again, let's make sure that we don't try and fix one problem and create another problem uh, along the way. Councilor Sununu, Democratic candidates for governor say that making the expansion of Medicaid permanent is a key component to fighting this crisis of addiction. With the current expansion set to expire next year, would you let that happen? And do you agree with some Republicans who believe that the expansion of Medicaid has actually made the problem of opioid addiction worse? Uh, well, I would start by saying I don't believe expansion of Medicaid has made the problem worse. I'm not quite sure what, what that's based on. Whether we go forward or not with Medicaid, that's a, that's a big issue. It's not solely based on, on uh, how it affects the opioid crisis. It's based on everything in terms of how it affects the taxpayers in the state of New Hampshire, because as we know, the federal government is paying less and less. I've always supported the idea of having a work requirement put into the expanded Medicaid program. And I've never supported just cutting 45,000 people right off the rolls. My plan looked at kind of grandfather them out, getting them onto more private plans, and then getting the eligibility requirements, because we really have two Medicaid systems here, the eligibility requirements in line with one another. Um, so it's, it's more of a fair system going forward. However we go forward, we must make sure that we don't put any additional tax burden directly on the, on the people of New Hampshire, and that, again, it's a plan for New Hampshire, not just one devised by the federal government. Mayor Gatsis, Councilor Sununu has been very critical of the response to the opiate crisis uh, at the state and the local level, a not so subtle dig perhaps at your leadership. What is your response? Well, that's again, perception versus reality. I can tell you my response is that we've gotten an awful lot of people to the table to find solutions. I talked to presidential candidates as they came into this state back in January and February and in last June to talk not only about the problem that we have here in the state of New Hampshire, but this problem that we have in this country. When it comes to doctors, I say that there should be a seven-day prescription mandate put on them, and it should be a law that says they can't prescribe longer than seven days and have the patients go in and get more prescriptions. And again, when we talk about the borders, are we going to stop every tourist that comes to the state of New Hampshire to check them to make sure that they're not carrying drugs into this state? How is the National Guard going to actually advocate for that or do it? Senator Forster. Yeah. Um, well, Mayor, I, I really am surprised that you don't understand or, or seem to be uninformed that the National Guard is actually working in Manchester now with law enforcement to try to deal with the heroin and opioid crisis in your city, in your city. And in fact, the high intensity drug task force area shows that along the mass border is where most of the drugs are coming in. So when I talk about using the National Guard, I say, yes, 
we should have all the tools in the toolbox using those tools. And I, quite honestly, I'm surprised that you wouldn't want to use all the tools available as governor to make sure we end this crisis. Take 30 seconds, Mayor. Well, thank you very much. We've uh, used every tool in the toolbox I don't here in think the Manchester. So. I don't think so. And I think, so. Senator, that when you talk about what are we going to do, it's what not What are you going to do? Well, Senator, I, I, I know that you are much more respectful in that, but certainly I'll give you an opportunity. I think okay. it's all about, have you talked to the chief of police? Does he think it's a good idea that the National Guard is coming into Manchester and fighting the opiate problem? I think I talk with the chief of police on a daily basis about the problems we have in the city, and he's never told me about the National Guards being in the front lines fighting this battle. Take 30 seconds, we've got to move on. Okay, so you're not aware that the National Guard is used as support in Manchester to deal with the heroin and opioid crisis. Is that what you're telling me? That's exactly what I'm telling okay, you. Okay, wow. I think you need to talk to someone. All right, we're going to move on to uh, an issue that a lot of people think is very related to the opioid crisis. That's mental health and a question coming from our panel, Dave Solomon. <laughs> Yes, the, the state currently sends certain uh, mentally ill patients to a secure unit in the state prison where they're housed like inmates even though they've committed no crime. Uh, do you think this is an appropriate way to deal with uh, mental illness? And if not, what would you do about this as governor, starting with uh, Senator Forrester? Well, I would have to know the particular uh, uh, issue or the particular, I guess, person being housed in the state prison. But no, S mental illness is, is a serious issue that we need to deal with here in the state of New Hampshire. And as you probably know, the governor signed a settlement, uh, negotiated a settlement for, for more mental health services in the state. And we've started down that road, but we need to do more. Uh, we need to make sure that people who have mental illnesses get the right care at the right time. And that means making sure that we have more beds open uh, so that those folks can be served and that we have the psychiatric nurses and the professional staff that we need to make sure those people get the help they need. Councilor Sununu, same question to you, talk about the state hospital. Well, let me tell you, the state has failed when it comes to mental health issues. I'll, I'll tell you that. Over the past few years, we've seen a variety of issues, not just in the prisons, but otherwise. Uh, as you may know, we had a, a marathon six-hour executive council meeting uh, last week because the governor was trying to push through and make sure we signed a long-term contract with a group that, frankly, there's a lot of questions about right now um, in terms of their employment practices at the, at the uh, state hospital, um, some incidents that happened because of that. Uh, I, I have stood up, and, and I was dealing with the Commissioner, frankly, back in May, I believe it was, when I wrote a letter to the Commissioner and we said, we need to put these contracts back out to bid. We need better options for the state of New Hampshire because I believe at the time only one group even bid on it, right? So when we're in the middle of one of the biggest mental health crises in this state, we only have one group coming in offering to help. That tells me something's wrong with the process. I'm going to be a governor that simplifies the process, make sure that when we're putting contracts out, we're getting the best options for the people in New Hampshire. And that's what is going to help mental health in the state, options. Representative Edel Blue. You know, it is disturbing to me to hear that we have mental health patients locked up in our prisons. That is simply wrong, and we have left the dark ages many, many years ago, and that should not be happening. In the legislature, money has been appropriated for the care of the mental, mentally ill. Beds have been opened. The money was slow to get out because Governor Hassan was not responding quickly enough. But beds have been set up that have not been filled. And so we still see, whether it's in our prisons or in our emergency rooms, mental health patients are not getting the treatment that we believe they need in our communities. Mayor Gatsas. Well, I can tell you that I remember a few years ago when a nurse at the Elliott Hospital got beat very badly by somebody that had a mental illness. And I can tell you that I brought the Senate along with House members to see if we couldn't find a way to fix the problem. Well, they came back and they added 10 more beds to Concord. Well, what happened? We still have 10 beds and only three people in them, and the emergency rooms are still full of folks that are waiting to get to Concord. That's just wrong. I hope we never see another incident like we saw at the Elliott and somebody that gets beat very badly. That's just not the New Hampshire way. All right, let's move on to another topic again from our panel. This one's coming from Allie Morris. So another area of concern when it comes to mental health is access to firearms. And New Hampshire is one of a few states that has not been sending certain mental health records to the federal criminal background check system known as the NICS. Uh, Attorney General Joe Foster has announced that in his view, a recently passed bill requires the Granite State to begin doing that. But some believe Foster is misinterpreting the law. Is he? And regardless of that answer, do you think the state should be sending mental health records for background checks? 
Councillor Sununu, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, look, I'm a big pro proponent of the Second Amendment. In this state, I think we do our, our firearms and, and gun laws pretty darn well. I do. I'd like to see constitutional carry uh, passed. I would sign that immediately. Um, the problem we have with this um, arbitrary mental health list is it opens up a whole world of, of confusion and privacy issues when it comes to who's classified as being mentally ill. Why are they on that list? What rights do the individuals have in terms of getting themselves off the list or arbitrating You know what, what the issues are? So again, just cast Casting tons of names onto this blank arbitrary list controlled by the federal government uh, gives me pause for concern. Mayor Gatz, the same question for you. Well, let me tell you that if somebody's been adjudicated of mental illness in the court of law, uh, yes, they should be sent out on a list. However, there should be an appeal process so that people have the opportunity to appeal that if in four or five years something changes. So again, if they've been adjudicated in a court of law, they should be put on that list. We had somebody here in the city of Manchester that shot two police officers. If they were on that list, they wouldn't have been able to buy a gun. Senator Forrester, your thoughts on this? I am a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, and I actually have been endorsed every term that I've served by the NRA. I believe that we have to be very careful about what we do with mental health records, and I'll give you a very quick story. I had a young woman who I know who came to me and said she had lost her mother a couple years ago, and it caused some real um, issues with her, and she saw a psychiatrist and for a few months until she got better. And she came to me and she because she, she had heard about this, and she was worried that her Second Amendment rights might be taken away by this and it was very concerning to her. She's better, she should have the right to own a gun, and she, and she does own a gun. And so I want to be very careful about those folks like her who have gone through a process and are, are better still have the right to own a gun. Thank and finally, you. Representative Edel Blue, do we expand background checks to include mental health records? Yeah, so thank you. So I also am a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I have received an A-plus rating from the New Hampshire Firearms Coalition. My next closest competitor up here has received a C. So mental illness is not a crime, and as such, individuals should not be forfeiting their constitutional rights because of that mental illness. All right, next question, we're going to talk about touching on climate change. As you all know, we are in one of the worst droughts New Hampshire has seen in decades. Parts of the country are on fire. Others are dealing with historic flooding. Uh, so I'm going to start with you on this one, uh, Representative Edel Blue. Do you agree with Donald Trump when he says that this is just weather or even a hoax? Right. So we do know that the temperature is warming. What we don't know is if that is man-made. We don't know what the causes of it are, if there's other causes. And we don't know that all of the efforts that are being taken have any opportunity to reverse that. So I would be very cautious to craft policy around what has become, really, in many circles, an ideology about climate change. Um, so I would not support you know, efforts that would uh, you know, limit our opportunities um, you know, for energy, which we need in our state and our, and our communities, uh, or other areas. So you're not sold it is real? I'm not sold. Okay. Councilor Sununu, same question. Uh, I'm an environmental engineer. I studied and worked in the environmental engineering field for 10 years. So this is something um, that I know a lot about. Uh, combine that with running a ski resort where we're completely weather dependent. Um, the earth has been slowly warming since the mid-1800s. There's, there's no doubt about that. Is it man-made or not? Look, one thing I do know, nobody knows for sure. Nobody knows absolutely one way or the other whether it's man-made or not. We have to be smart. And with myself in the governor's office, we have the opportunity to have a governor that understands these issues at a deep grassroots level, that really understands both the economic, social, and environmental um, pros and cons of all these issues that come before us. So I'm going to bring my expertise to the table, make smart, sound decisions that are environmentally sound, to be sure, and sustainable, but also always in mind with how we keep progress moving forward, how we keep businesses moving forward, how we don't bog, bog them down with over-regulation. One of the biggest concerns of this entire issue is that we've created all this regulation that pushes down on businesses and pushes down on individuals. I'm going to free that up and do it smart and responsibly. Mayor Gatsas, same question. <laughs> well, I can tell you that, no, I don't believe in it because I know that we might have had a very mild winter this year and we saved an awful lot of money in our snow budget. But I can tell you that next year, may, we may not be as lucky. So when people want to talk about climate change and what we're doing about it, we don't do much because Mother Nature controls it. So I can't tell you if it's man-made or if it's Mother Nature. But boy, I'll tell you, I wouldn't mind another winter like we had last year so that we wouldn't have the snow removal costs that uh, we've had in the future or the salting.
So again, it's about what Mother Nature has sent on us. All right, Senator Forrester, is climate change real? I think climate change happens through the history, goes up and down, warm and cold. Uh, I believe that there may be a little bit man-made, but most of it, I believe, is natural. And I would be very concerned about any policies that we might um, institute in the state of New Hampshire that will cause energy prices to rise, more and more regulation. We have to be very cautious and methodical about the policies uh, that we enact in the state to protect the people of New Hampshire. And so uh, while, it, while there might be cl climate change, how much of that is man-made, I'm not really sure, uh, but I, it, it is happening. All right, uh, let's change yeah, pace. I just want to go on record. I would love to see some snow in the North Country. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that we have our plowing, plowing budgets too, but the North Country and the business up there would love to see some snow this year. Check Yesterday's El Nino was tomorrow's La Nina. All right. No problem with that. All right, let's move forward. Let's change the pace a little bit. We're going to go to a lightning round, get you on record on a couple of different issues here. If you keep your answers to yes or no, that'd be great. A few seconds, that'd be okay too. Start with Senator Forrester. If governor uh, and a bill repealing the hands free law came to your desk, would you sign it? Yes. Um, I, I think we'd have to see. I, I don't know. I'd have to see the bill, to be honest. I mean, I like repealing hands free you in terms of the driving. I, look, yeah. I think I think it's a, it's a safety issue and I, and I like it. I mean, I would not take it all the way back to where we were. No. All right. Fair enough. Mayor Gatsas. No, I would not uh, repeal it. And yes, Representative Bill. Blue. All right. Good deal. Uh, starting with you going this way now, uh, Representative Bill Blue. What time should last call be in New Hampshire? <laughs> <laughs> Late. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's not. You don't want to pick an hour. hour. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that uh, the legislature passed something that said two o'clock, and it was enabling legislation to the communities. I had some people come in and talk to me about it, and I can tell you that one o'clock was sufficient for what what would needed to be done in the businesses. Councilor Sununu, I'd love to see two a.m. Two a.m. I wouldn't change what we have. I would not change what we have. So next question, going back again, should a governor's term in New Hampshire be for four years? I think that's up to the, the people of the state of New Hampshire to decide that. Councilor Sununu. Uh, no, I love that it's two years because you know what? If you're not doing your job, you get thrown out. That's a great power that the people have in this state, a great um, feedback response system, if you will. I'm the, it's, maybe it's the engineer in me, but I love the fact that if you do a good job you can, and you want to stay, you can. And if you're not doing a good job, the power is with the people. Two-year terms, too much campaigning? Two years. Two years it is, and Representative Edel Blue. I agree that it's up to the people. I would support four years. I like that idea. Okay, and lastly, just to get you on record, uh, once again, going uh, from Frank Edelblue all the way down to Jeannie Forrester, should New Hampshire have a minimum wage? No. No. Gatsas. No. No. Could have guessed that. All right, there we go. We're going to move <laughs> forward now. Next question coming from That's our panel. That's the next debate, Josh. I know. <laughs> Good point. All right, well, next question coming from our panel. Dave Solomon, the union leader. Take it away. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Planned Parenthood funding has been a recurring issue, as you all know. And... Defunding Planned Parenthood could have an effect beyond potentially limiting abortion. It could also mean less access to health care for women, especially in certain parts of the state where there are not a lot of other options. So uh, if you vote down Planned Parenthood funding, should you make sure other options are available first? Uh, this question for Mayor Gatsis and Councillor Sununu, starting with Mayor Gatsis. Well, I can tell you that, number one, I would never use state dollars, taxpayers' dollars, to fund Planned Parenthood. Uh, we need to have the conversation of what was just before us a few weeks ago uh, when Councillor Sununu voted for it. He voted for a retroactive contract. And I understand retroactive contracts, but this is for wages. It was for nothing more than repaying Planned Parenthood on the wages they had already paid, not for any sort of services. And in that line item in the budget, it was in a deficit. Now, I don't think anybody would do that in their own personal company. I don't think the chief executive in the state of New Hampshire would do that when, when he's looking at a budget. We should never think about paying when we don't have the money to pay for it. That's something that people talk about. So again, that's perception versus reality. Councilor, uh, I would never and have never supported taxpayer funding of abortions. Absolutely not. But let's understand, this was a health care contract. This was a contract for health care services for low-income women, children, families. Um, and, and please keep in mind, this contract's been around for 40 years. Every conservative governor before me has signed this exact same contract because they knew 
that as much as they might disagree with Planned Parenthood, it's about putting people over politics. It's about quality health care services for women. And Mayor Gatsas talks about the retroactive contract. We do retroactive contracts in the council. We do retroactive health care contracts in the council. This is, un uh, this is nothing new. So again, making sure that we have leadership in the corner office, that, that casts a vote every time with the constituents in mind, with people in mind, not vote simply out of political expediency, but that's part of being a, a public servant. There's a public trust in there, isn't there? There's a public trust that says, I'm going to cast my vote with my constituents in mind. It's what I've done as the executive counselor, and it's exactly what I'm going to do as governor. Mayor Gassis. Perception versus reality. I talked to two of those Republican governors, and they told me that if there was a deficit in that line item, they would never support a retroactive agreement. I talked to two of them. So I suggest that the press maybe want to call all four of them and see what they say. All right, we're going to move forward now with another question coming from our panel and Adam Sexton. And this one goes to Representative Edelblu and Senator Forrester. New Hampshire's unemployment rate right now is at 2.9 percent, and businesses are complaining that they can't find enough skilled workers to find those jobs. In fact, we just spoke to some employment officials up in Concord, and they said they had a job fair. There were a thousand openings; only 336 people showed up. Given that, how can the state attract new companies if there's not enough of a skilled workforce available? And let's start with Representative Edelblu. So this is one of the most important questions in this election because we've got some structural problems in our economy. You're right, we have 2.9 percent unemployment, which is essentially full employment, but that covers over the underlying things that are happening. We rank 39th in terms of GDP growth. We rank 49th in terms of productivity growth, and that's where wage increases, pay increases come from. If we are going to attract new businesses into the state, we need to create an environment in which businesses and individuals are willing to invest, which means we need to work on the skill set of our workforce. Kids coming out of high school don't have the skills to engage a 21st century workforce. We need to lower our health care costs, which are the highest in the country, our energy costs, which are one of the highest in the country. We need to continue to reduce our business taxes, which today are still higher than any of our New England neighbors. And we need to stop the crushing blow of regulation, which is impeding businesses. Forrester. Um, I am the only candidate who's laid out a conservative economic plan to get New Hampshire back on track. I believe it's critically, critically important that we create the, the environment here in New Hampshire that attracts businesses to this state, not only attracts the businesses to come to the state, which will create those high paying jobs, but to also help those businesses who are here expand and grow. And I think uh, that's where we're, we really need to do some work. And, and it is about reducing regulation, getting rid of the hurdles that get in the way of small businesses. And my plan addresses these issues. It does talk about workforce. It does talk about <clears throat> energy costs and all the things that we need to do to make sure this economy gets jump started and is headed in the right direction. Thank you, Senator. It's possible, according to a recent WMUR Granite State poll, that opinion on the death penalty could be shifting in New Hampshire. If elected, would you sign or veto legislation repealing capital punishment? And if you would sign that legislation on the repeal, what would you do about the state's lone death row inmate? Let's start with Representative Edelblu. So if someone were to come after me or my family, I would absolutely not hesitate to use force potentially deadly force against them to protect myself and my family. But once we have someone who has been locked away, they've been incarcerated, and they no longer are a threat to our communities, I do not support the death penalty, and I think that we should just lock them up and throw the key away. Councillor Sununu, would you repeal the death penalty? I support the death penalty laws that we have in this state. All right. Mayor Gatsis. I would veto any bill that comes across my desk that says repeal the death penalty because we have somebody on death row, as you just said, that killed a Manchester police officer. And anybody that kills a police officer in the line of duty should be looking at the death penalty. And Senator Forrester. I do support the death penalty that we have here in New Hampshire. Look, it's been very, very used very little here in the state of New Hampshire. I think in the 30s or the 40s was the last time it was used. Um, when, when I talk to law enforcement and they ask for our support on this issue, I am going to be there for them every single time because I think it's important to send a message to our law enforcement that we support them. And when I talk to county attorneys and prosecutors and other folks, 
in the system, they say that the, 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 her, the, the bar is very high about who gets the death penalty. So I'm very confident in the system we have in place right now. And very quickly, for the three candidates who are in favor of the death penalty, do you think it should be expanded, the statute here in New Hampshire, uh, as it was under Governor Lynch, perhaps drug dealers or something else? Mayor Gatsas. I would look at expansion of the death penalty if it had to do with a minor. Uh, yeah, I think there, there are situations when we can look at expanding, again, whether it's making sure uh, issues that deal with law enforcement, minors, um, uh, there's, there's definitely room for that. Better. Absolutely. I, I think in, in the case of particularly of drug dealers who sell drugs to somebody that leads to a death, they should absolutely, if they are tried for murder and, and convicted, they should face the death penalty. Absolutely. We need to be serious with drug dealers in the state of New Hampshire. All right. Thanks for the response, candidates. Now to a question that was submitted to our Facebook page. This one's coming from Heather Duncan in Exeter, and she's asking, do you support Common Core? If not, what will you do to get it out of our state? And we'll start with Senator Forrester with this. I do not support Common Core. I think parents need to are the best judges of how um, the, the best education for their children. I happen to be a founding member of a charter school. I believe parents know best what's good for their children, whether it's a private school, public school, home school, or charter school. Parents need to be in the driver's seat. And I would, uh, if governor, one of the first things that I would do is reject or pull back from Common Core. Mayor Gatsas? Well, Common there's no Core. question that in the city of Manchester, we fought against Common Core. I took a vote uh, along with the school board that said we weren't going to implement Common Core in the city. We then got letters from the federal government and the state education department saying that if, if you don't change your votes, you're going to lose $46 million of funding and if you don't change your votes, the state of New Hampshire will lose $420 million. Unlike some of my opponents, uh, Chris Sununu being one, he's voted twice to put in the chairman of the, excuse me, the, the commissioner of education twice, who's a big proponent of Common Core. Also, board members. So I can tell you that any commissioner that I place into education, the two things they have to be thinking about is parental choice and local control. Those are very important things, and that's the way you fight Common Core. But I can tell you that as governor, I'm going to eliminate Common Core from our educational system because I can tell you that it's not right for the children. Councilor Sununu? Common Core has to be scrapped. No ifs, ands, or buts about it 100%. And again, I don't, I don't talk about that because I read a, a talking point on a political piece of paper. I'm a dad. I'm a parent. I have a fifth grader and a sixth grader. I've, I'm in their classrooms. And I'm seeing what Common Core has done to erode quality, individualized curriculum in our classrooms. The teachers are just as frustrated. I call it the invisible handcuffs. We got to empower teachers and parents and let them do what they do best so that they have the time and effort to maybe give a, a child a little extra help who needs it. Or maybe challenge a child who could be challenged a little more. When my son came home last year and told me that he practiced for the Common Core exam 20 straight days, there was nothing educational about that. We've gotten to the point where we're just testing to see who practiced the most. Let's get practical. Let's get real about what's going on in our classrooms. There is no place in our state more than in our classrooms where Washington has reached in with their regulations, with their bureaucracy, and completely eroded individualized education and control of the parents and teachers. We're right back to perception yep. and reality on that one, Josh, because again, the council had the opportunity to vote twice against that uh, commissioner of education and didn't. But today he's in an election and he wants to blow up the Department of Education. Quick response, we gotta move on. Yeah, I've said I would, I, I'm very disappointed in some of the votes on the, on the Board of Education. And I've said very clearly and publicly, I would gut it. I would really gut that Board of Education because they have lost, again, the philosophies and principles of local control in our schools. Representative Edible. You know, in an age of innovation, where everything around us is becoming personalized, why would we ever imagine that homogenizing education, making education the same, not only across the state, but around the country, is a good idea? We all know that not all third graders learn at the same pace. We all know that young girls learn faster than young boys at that age. You know, so we have an opportunity to take our education system into the future, into the 21st century, and move and break free from this model of industrial education that is not helping us. And it's curious now to see that the mayor is against Common Core because in the city of Manchester, he put in Common Core light 
Tom Raffio, the chairman of the State Board of Education, admitted that the Manchester standard includes 80% Common Core. Now, he changed the name so that the parents wouldn't notice, but that's still Common Core. Mayor the truth yes. on that, Josh, is that there were only two communities in the state of New Hampshire that changed their educational policies when it came to Common Core. And, and Representative Edelblut, I didn't see Wilton, I didn't see you standing there in Wilton trying to change the Common Core that was coming before that educational community. So then we're agreeing it's 80% Common Core no, in Manchester. It's, it's Thank that you. There were only two, two communities in the state that did anything about Common Core because we were going to lose funding. All right, thank you candidates, and thank you Heather Duncan for submitting that question. Let's go back to our panel. Next question coming from Monitor Reporter, Concord Monitor, Allie Morris. So another child care question. At the Republican National Convention this year, Donald Trump's daughter Ivanka said that if he were elected president, the businessman would focus on making quality child care affordable and accessible for all. Will you make that a priority as governor, and should the state spend money on that goal? Uh, first to you, Councillor Sununu. Um, I've always been a proponent of uh, a, a kindergarten in all our schools. If the local communities choose to have kindergarten, I think the state needs to put up their matching piece uh, to fund it. I think that's one of the first things uh, that we can really achieve at the state level. Um, it's not child care. Um, let's understand that uh, beginning at the age of two, uh, my wife was a special ed teacher. She specialized in early childhood education. Really beginning at those early ages, as, as Representative Edelblut uh, referenced, uh, that's really the formative years, right? It's not just about child care. It's about making sure that all our kids have real opportunities with education, real opportunities with choice, and that parents have that, that flexibility. One of the best ways we can do that is drive an economy, get our wages up, bring more opportunity to those individual families so they have the resources they need, provide more options for families so they're not just stuck in one school district or one, one avenue of, of uh, hope for themselves and their families, providing quality school choice, supporting uh, kindergarten at all levels um, and education at all levels, that's a real priority and something we can achieve. Representative Edelblue. So we know in New Hampshire already 52% of individuals are engaged in early childhood um, you know, education. But we also know that early childhood education does not have lasting results. So we need this to be a local issue, not a state mandate. If a local community wants to do that in their school district, that's a job for the local school board, not for the, uh, the state to mandate that on schools. Now, my wife happens to have studied early, ch early childhood education, and she knows something about this. And I can tell you what happens is, when you engage those kids early like that, any advances that they've gotten have disappeared by third grade, and yet there's other problems that have manifest themselves, behavioral issues that the kids then have to deal with. So I don't think it's something that we want a state mandate on. Senator Forster. I think we've, uh, we've got an awful lot of great daycare centers in the state of New Hampshire. I believe um, that we do need to focus on young children. Child care is appropriate. But I believe in New Hampshire we need to uh, look into private-public partnerships for our daycare centers. And when I think about my visit down to the seacoast at a nursing home, and what they were doing there, which was really very innovative and creative is for them, was to have a daycare center for their staff, for their employees, so that they could actually attract and hire staff to work in their uh, nursing home, right there in the nursing home, a daycare center. So yes, yeah, certainly, I think child, child care is important. I think we need to be creative and innovative and, and uh, explore more private public partnerships. And Mayor Gatz, the same question. Thank you, Josh, for the question. Let me tell you that in the city of Manchester, when I first took office, we made kindergarten full time. It was full day kindergarten. It cost us $295,000 so that those kids could be in school all day. Because we understand that ed early education is important. And obviously, with the diversified population that we have, some of those parents can't afford daycare, and they can't afford different things for their children. So making kindergarten full-time was a good thing. The state still only pays 50% of it, but the city of Manchester thought it was worthy that we would move forward. All right, uh, time is flying here, guys. Uh, we're almost out of time. What are we doing next? We're going to closing statements. You, you drew for podium position earlier, uh, and I believe that would be who went first? <laughs> I did. Senator Forrester, <laughs> apologize. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, 
Thank you all so much, w WMUR, and the union leader, for hosting tonight's debate. I thought it was a great opportunity for people to learn about the candidates. There are four candidates, folks, and today you have a choice. You have a choice. You can choose a conservative Republican who's going to put together conserv real conservative change in New Hampshire. I am proud that I was endorsed by the union leader uh, because I have the experience. I am the most conservative and I have the best chance of winning in the, no in the November election. Look, these other guys, you got one over here who's uh, been fooled time and time again, Planned Parenthood, rolled over by Eversource, uh, had the wool pulled over his eyes relative to his investors. You got another guy over here who's lost control of the city, 167% increase in murder, 14 to 15. 44% increase in rape. He's lost control. And then you got the guy at the end who has no plans for New Hampshire. I am ready on day one to deliver conservative change in New Hampshire, and I can do the job. And one more thing I'd like to say, Susan B. Th Susan B. Anthony List, I'm proud to say, endorsed me tonight. Thank you. All right, Councillor Sununu, your closing statement, please. Thank you, Josh. Thank you to MUR and the union leader. Um, it's been actually a lot of fun up here. Um, look, I got into this race a year ago because I understood that to really campaign and get your message out in, in this state, you got to travel the entire state. You got to visit all the cities and towns. I grew up in Salem. I live on the seacoast. My business is up in the North Country. You have to have a, a governor that really understands how policy is impacting people's lives. It's one of the number one things I hear on the campaign trail. They want a stakeholder in that corner office. They want a governor that lives and breathes by the same rules as everybody else. So whether we're talking about the high cost of, of health care, energy policy, regulation, business taxes, I deal with these issues every single day in my business. We're constantly managing to them. That's the experience we need in the corner office. I'm very passionate about education. Again, I'm a dad. I'm in my kids' classrooms. We need to scrap Common Core. We need to promote real school choice. We need to make a difference in the, in the lives of the children and the parents and empower teachers to do what they do best. That's quality individualized education. In New Hampshire, we have an amazing opportunity to win back the corner office with proven conservative leadership. I'm the candidate that can win in November. I hope to earn your support and earn your vote next Tuesday. Mayor Ted Gassis. Well, I want to thank you all for watching. This election has come down to trust, leadership, and experience. Who do you trust to, get, to make sure they fight the opiate epidemic? Who do you trust to get Common Core out of the classrooms? Who do you, who's the leader that's going to cut taxes, regulations, energy costs, and health insurance costs so that our economy can start growing jobs? And who's got the experience to find the solutions to those problems? Because we can't wait to fix them. It's got to be immediate. So on September 13th, I ask for your vote because this election is about trust, leadership, and experience. And our final closing statement of the night coming from Representative Frank Edelblum. Thank you so much. I am not a career politician. I am the only endorsed liberty and conservatives value candidate in this race. Running for governor was not on my bucket list of things to do. I'm a job creator. But for too long, we the people have not been represented in the corner office. My fellow candidates up here, they imagine that being the governor is the prize that they are after. They dream about being the governor at night. I dream about fixing New Hampshire for the people. You now have a choice to vote for someone who is not beholden to the lobbyists and the special interests. Vote Frank Edelblue for on September 13th, and you will not be disappointed. Well, candidates, that's going to wrap up our GOP debate for governor. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate you. your participation. Thanks, Josh.